All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the second of our two roundtables with Concordia University Research Chairs, the newest cohort of chairs. Uh, we welcome you into this event via Zoom. And of course, as you can see, we're in for space proper as well. For those of you unfamiliar with us, Concordia University's for space is located in downtown Jajage, Montreal, on unceded indigenous land. And we operate as the front door to the university, collaborating with our wonderful community, uh, to make Concordia research initiatives and course activities publicly accessible through any number of interactive events such as today. So as I mentioned, we are lucky to uh, be joined today in the space with three of the newest uh, Kirks, the rest of whom are joining us via Zoom as you are um, audience members. So I'll remind you, since you are joining us through Zoom, that if you do have a question during the Q&A period, you're more than welcome to raise a virtual hand and we'll happily sweep in and unmute you and allow you to speak. But if you prefer to write it out, please do use the Q&A box. I'll keep my eye on there and uh, bring any questions to our moderator. Speaking of whom, it is my pleasure to pass the floor to Interim Vice President, Research and Graduate Studies, Paula Wood Adams. Welcome, Paula. Thanks so much, Anna. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you know, last week we hosted the first of these um, two roundtables with five of our newly appointed Concordia University Research Chairs. Um, the exchange was engaging and lively with those colleagues, all coming from vastly different fields and finding commonality between their thoughts, ideas and approaches. This community building and learning from each other is an important aspect of these roundtables. And I'm really looking forward to today's conversation as well with the remaining seven 2021 Concordia University Research Chairs. Um, the Concordia University Research Chair Program plays an important role in deepening our research capacity, as well as in strengthening the training of highly qualified personnel. These research chairs also lead the university's posi positioning in strategic research areas. We currently have a total of 60 uh, Concordia University research chairs at the tier one, tier two, and new scholar levels. The goal of today's event is to provide an opportunity for our no newest uh, chairs to meet each other and to create a sense of community. Through sharing their research program objectives, there's also the chance to create potential collaborations. Time permitting, we also want to engage and exchange with you in the audience and let our community, both internal and external, learn more about what a university research chair is. So please feel free to ask questions. As Anna said, um, you can use the Q&A function if you like. I'm so happy that we're able to exchange with these leaders in their respective fields and learn more about what they do. So let's begin. First of all, we'll start with some brief introductions. Um, and I'd like to uh, start with Zeynep Arcel and um, ask her to please tell us uh, her chair title and also a little bit about uh, her research chair program. Zeynep. Thank you, Paula. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Zainab Parcel. Um, the title of my research chair is Consumption, Markets and Society. Um, so I'm interested in the everyday practices of people and how these practices are both shaped, but also are shaping markets and society. So my broader assumption is that we live in the 21st century predominantly through consumerism, whether you agree or not, and that in its various forms, these are shaping the society, individual action, organizations. Um, so how people, for example, pursue identity projects through consumption, how they become taste experts, how they interact with each other in uh, commercial platforms, and uh, how these also are shaping the way we, we live as a society and how do markets and organizations evolve. Um, so during the mandate of my chair, I think I will be particularly focused on uh, two key areas. Uh, it's one is the platforms and how 
the individual and market level implications of, of platforms. So for example, why are we suddenly started to follow so many cats and dogs and raccoons on Instagram, right? Uh, but also how it, does it shape the way we relate to other, other species um, and our, our understandings of, uh, of relationality? Um, how did influencer became a profession? Um, and how does it shape we do marketing as a field? And also how do ordinary people think about, for example, privacy on their platforms and, and meaning making, when especially we live in this area of surveillance. Um, and the other area is kind of interrelated, but moral bigger shifts in the market, whether um, circular economy, plant-based diets or greenhousing. So, so all these kind of span wide range of ideas, but they kind of are at the center of understanding how everyday activities organizations, particularly market organizations, I'm in marketing, but also the society. Thank you. Thanks so much, Zainab. Um, now I'd like to pass it over to Stephanie Duguay. All right, thank you, Paula. Um, my chair is in digital intimacy, gender, and sexuality. And what that means is looking at how digital technologies and digital media affect those different facets of our lives. So in my research, there are different objectives. One of these is to look at how digital technologies shape the way that we represent ourselves, our gender, and our sexuality to other people. Another area of my research looks at how digital technologies are shaping our relationships, shaping how we meet people, how we date, um, and particularly looking at dating apps as a popular new technology and what it means for the landscapes of our relationships. I'm also interested in emerging research methods to investigate digital technologies as they develop. Um, lots of these technologies are brand new. <laughs> so how do we keep up with that? How do we uh, ensure that we're investigating platforms and examining their role in our lives? Um, yeah, and then also there's elements of my research that look at what does it mean when sexuality um, and relationships and identity became, become data, you know, they become datafied and then um, integrated into technologies that are automated and use artificial intelligence. What does this mean for uh, how we relate to ourselves and other people? Uh, so those are just a few of the different directions that my research is taking. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, now I would like to invite Rafiq Nakash to speak. Yeah. Uh, hello, so uh, I'm a prof in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, and the title of my chair is uh, Sustainable Multifunctional Nanomaterials. And that really reflects uh, very well with the research that we do in our lab, uh, because my amazing research team is, is really interested in nanomaterials because we know that at the nanoscale, we discover new properties that we do not observe uh, or see in any other domain. And uh, one of the things particularly that we'd like to focus on is how to make these nanomaterials in a very sustainable fashion. And uh, specifically because of that, we're very interested in working with carbon nanomaterials because carbon is quite ubiquitous around us. We find it in many things around us, in natural resources or even simple uh, molecules that we can use to prepare these nanomaterials. But what's more interesting is also how we can control the properties of this material and tailor them so then we can get to uh, see how we can use those to develop new technologies and within that vein what we're interested in is developing technologies where, for sensing applications so it could be in biological sensing it could be environmental sensing uh, or even in uh, for 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 green energy and essentially uh, fuel conversion, maybe in biofuels. And what that allows us to do is if we continue down that sustainable path uh, would be to really answer the needs uh, for today's uh, population, but without really uh, compromising uh, future uh, of future generations. Yeah. Thanks, Rafi. Um, now I will pass it along to Preg Pillay. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, the title of my chair is uh, Design and Performance of uh, Electric Machines. Um, and uh, I apply these electrical machines. Well, electrical machines are applied to a variety of applications like electric vehicles in wind turbines, in uh, various forms of renewable energy generation, for example. 
So um, I was first a Hydro-Quebec Industrial Research Chair where I applied these ideas to renewable energy systems. Uh, currently, I'm focusing more on electric vehicles, working with some local companies on developing um, the main drive system. So when you look at an electric vehicle like a Prius or a Tesla, the heart of this vehicle is an electrical machine. And it is quite complex and it has quite severe demands upon it. So how does one design this? Um, how do we meet the performance requirements? Uh, this is the research that I do on the electrical vehicle side. In addition, we have a fairly large uh, CFI project uh, where we're building and have built recently a solar house at the Loyola campus. I'm heavily involved in that project where the idea is to power up the house using uh, solar energy and batteries. But even more importantly, or as importantly, uh, to look at the possibility of uh, powering up a house using your own vehicle. So at the moment you can buy an electric vehicle, you can charge it from your house. But in an emergency, it's possible with some improvements in the technology to power up the house from the vehicle. Um, some of you may have been here during the last ice storm. It was quite severe loss of power because most of our power comes from some distance away in base and James. And um, when you lose that power, the island is really uh, isolated. Um, and so the possibility of having emergency power like in, on an island or even in one building um, is quite important. In a high rise building, you need to uh, operate the elevators, for example, in emergency and the power is down, what do you do? Well, it turns out these electric vehicles can be used for these sorts of purposes. So this is uh, some of the new directions that I'll be investigating uh, as part of this chair. Thanks, Preg. That sounds super interesting. Um, now I'd like to ask Kathleen Vaughn to speak. Thank you, Paula. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Concordia University Research Chair in Art and Education for Sustainable and Just Futures, which means that as an artist and as a professor in art education, I'm very concerned with how art can help fire imagination and motivate people to make changes that we need to make in our society in order to have more sustainable and just futures for all of us. So my, my work going forward in the next five years will look at three different strands. One continues some ongoing work I'm doing with environmental scientists on the ecosystems of the St. Lawrence River. How is it that we here in Montreal seem to really be oriented to our beautiful Mount Royal, but somehow don't always connect to the shoreline of the river. And so I notice this particularly in my home community of Point St. Charles, where the shoreline has been changed by over a kilometer through the last 200 years of infilling, which of course reduces our not only our access, but our emotive connection and our desire to protect and be effective stewards for the river. So I'll continue my work on the river. I'm also interested in material practices of making, how we decide on the materials that we use as artists, perhaps as designers, that are more rather than less sustainable. I'm particularly interested in wool. I love wool. I work with textiles myself and wool is this magical fiber that is sustainable, biodegradable, antibacterial, uh, inflammable. It acts as a fire retardant. It's warm. You know, you get wet when you're wearing wool and you don't freeze to death, you know, so that there's all kinds of things that are on a personal social level, but there are ways that sustainable sheep farming can help sequester carbon in our soil and uh, work in a more holistic way to improve our environmental stages. And so these are things that animate me. And for the third part of my research chair, I will be looking at ways that teaching in art education can prepare our students to be facilitators and leaders and, you know, kind of inspirations, but also good lenses of others' needs in communities. So how do, how do we prepare our uh, the students who are going to be moving from Concordia into the world to help move the world and their and its many communities forward through art in a great way. So that's sort of my work. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, the next person to speak will be uh, Thomas Walker. 
Thank you, Paula. Um, so I'm the Concordia University, University Research Chair in Emerging Risk Management. Uh, and uh, um, emerging risk management is a, is a broad area. <laughs> so in other words, it includes technological risks. It includes, uh, well, pandemics also, you know, I mean, we have, we have a new risk that we, that we didn't really think about, you know, for, for, for well, the last hundred years, I suppose, at least in this, in this magnitude. Um, it includes, uh, you know, climate change. So, so anything that, that risk managers at, the, at uh, individual companies, at, at uh, banks, at insurance firms, and so on, pension funds, um, you know, face right now, uh, and, you know, in many in many cases, the, the traditional risk modeling approaches they don't work anymore these days. So um, it is hard to predict, you know, based on historical data, a pandemic, you know, and what impact it has on individual company performances, on on uh, broader systemic risks for the entire economy. Um, it uh, it's also difficult, for example, uh, to predict what what uh, let's say not maybe just one hurricane. But for example, a series of hurricanes in the same area would have on the what what impact it would have on the insurance industry and the reinsurance industry. So a single hurricane, we can typically, you know, those are insurable. Uh, even though Katrina already put a lot of pressure on the system, but if there's a series of of uh, major events, one after another every year or or you know every couple of months, um, that puts severe pressures on on uh, like I said the financial system, uh, individual companies, the financial system. System. Um, and so anything that, that has to do, like I said, with climate change, uh, um, also the, the, in, on a more technological side, uh, uh, new developments like, like uh, cryptocurrencies, blockchain technology, uh, uh, digitalization, I guess, overall artificial intelligence, those are things that we, that we try to look at in our center. So I have a research group also that is, uh, consists of several colleagues and, and students uh, that are very supportive and uh, uh, we try to target as much as we can this area, but uh, a lot more work is needed to be honest. It's a, it's a big area. <laughs> Thanks, Thomas. Sounds like you'll be busy for the next few years. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> All right. Um, and now, finally, I'd like to ask Carly um, Zitter to introduce herself. All right. Thank you, Paula. Wonderful to hear all of those diverse perspectives. So I am the Concordia University Research Chair in Urban Ecology and Sustainability. And we are living right now in the most urban world we have ever had. More than half of our world's people live in cities. Those cities are growing quickly. And in many ways, these cities are, are deeply embedded in ongoing crises, the biodiversity crisis, the climate crisis, um, COVID. And so my research group and I focus on understanding how all of the bits and pieces of green spaces within our cities, our parks, our street trees, our yards, our our rivers, so I'll include the blue spaces after hearing about our wonderful rivers. Uh, how do those spaces both support biodiversity? So how do they support you know, our trees, our bees, our birds that live alongside us in the city? And also how do they provide benefits to people? So for example, how does the way that we manage our green spaces influence summer heat waves, floods, improve our mental health? And with my research chair, I'm really interested in a few different aspects of this. So first, how do those two pieces interact? If we can manage our green infrastructure in our cities to conserve more biodiversity, does that also benefit us, the people who live in these cities? But also, how do we reduce barriers to action and uh, implement best practices within our green spaces. So really working across disciplines, working with stakeholders, working with organizations to make our cities greener and more sustainable and close that knowledge to action gap. And so the research that my students and I do, uh, what we try to do is emphasize the ways that green infrastructure in our cities isn't just something that's nice to have, but that is actually critical to living well and living safely. Thanks, Carly. So um, now what we're going to do is we're going to dive a little bit deeper into each of your areas of expertise by having each of you ask another person a question. And I'm gonna start us off by asking Kathleen a question. So Kathleen, 
how do you start a new socially engaged art project and where does the inspiration come from? Thanks, Paula. Um, I'll answer the best I can. I'd say that sometimes, uh, you know, the, the, the gods visit you. You pay attention to what's happening in the world and you see something that acts as a kind of an excitement, a trigger, a uh, little thread, you know, my textile thing that you start to pull and you see that there is potential for engagement and for uh, research and activity. So um, I think of a lot of my work as place-based, meaning that I work in place that I constitute as, you know, with the natural uh, environment, with the social environment, the historical, the cultural histories, our colonial histories, of course, in this context. And so there are ways that all of these ideas circulate together and can become a kind of conversation of practice as you're developing something that's socially engaged. So a lot of the work that I do is in my own studio with materials, but a lot has a public outreach component where I'm working with members of the public to hear their stories and ideas. What does the St. Lawrence River mean to them? What do they remember about the river from their childhood? What do they wish for the future? Uh, or what can they make not using language since not everybody's intelligence is, you know, resides in language? What can they make using material practice to show something that uh, supports ideas about uh, the future, uh, just futures environmentally for many creatures, not just humans, but including humans. So it's a, it's a bit of a, a kind of a, like an ongoing tapestry of ideas and practices. I take great inspiration from my students who are usually much smarter than I am about many things and very connected to the world and to the issues that will be moving us through this millennium, we hope in, in good shape. And, um, and I listen, I, I think my practice is a lot about listening and then engaging, conversing, making. Yeah, that's super interesting. I really, I really love how you, um, uh, how you see yourself as listening and um, look to your students to lead. That's uh, that's really inspiring. Um, I think the next step is for you to ask Prague a question, if I'm not mistaken, Kathleen. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes, I I really enjoyed Prague having a look at some of the work that you have done very much different from my expertise. I can't do it justice from a content perspective, but all the different things that you have done around the world, uh, awards and research projects that showcase the excellence of the uh, activities that you've been engaged in with others, developing really important projects to do with renewable energy and energy efficiency. But I guess because I'm so interested in place and you yourself mentioned the ice storm and James Bay, I wonder whether being in Montreal, you know, you know, we have not always the nicest of winters. Actually, the St. Lawrence River Valley, I found out recently, is the, uh, the freezing rain capital of the world. So, uh, we, yay. Uh, but does that, does our location pose special challenges for some of the work you do in terms of some of that reciprocal energy exchange between buildings and vehicles and, and the way we might go forward to, to draw on uh, efficient energy sources. Absolutely. Uh, cold climates is a huge challenge, for, especially, for example, for electric vehicles. The range of the electric vehicle reduces substantially um, with temperature. So we have enormous uh, challenges in that area. Even uh, power generation, there's something called run of the river or hydrokinetic systems where you, you don't have to dam up the river. You don't create a big ecological uh, drama. It's a uh, run of the river. You're just using the current flow to generate power. Well, even that becomes far more difficult if you have ice in the uh, flowing in the river. It, it's a huge problem trying to deal with that. Um, and uh, in electric vehicles, in all kind of uh, energy storage, or not all kinds, especially battery energy storage, it has uh, temperature has a very serious effect on performance. So if you look at the first electric vehicles, they were all released in California and Arizona. There was a good reason for that uh, because of temperature. And so we have challenges here. Just recently, I was talking to a new chemical engineering professor who has ideas on how to improve 
uh, battery performance in cold climates. So this is where um, uh, very interesting research ideas can come and be initiated because we have the capacity, but we also have the challenges. We also have remote communities uh, in Northern Quebec. There are about uh, 20 remote communities that are not connected to the grid. And um, uh, the challenge of uh, transportation of food, of fuel is, is uh, extremely uh, important. It's a serious problem. They pay something like uh, 80 cents to a dollar per kilowatt hour for energy, whereas we pay something like six cents per kilowatt hour in Montreal. So the the challenges of um, not just Montreal, but and the Saint Lawrence Valley, but in Quebec, uh, northern Quebec, also in power generation, and then in terms of transporting food to these communities and medicines, is very difficult uh, during. Um, uh, actually, in the winter, you sometimes have a better chance for transporting because the uh, you have frozen lakes and rivers, uh, but in between seasons is quite a challenge. So it's not only, <coughs> excuse me, it's not only the extreme cold, but sometimes in between seasons that we have that can last a long time that makes uh, roads impassable. So yeah, uh, there's so many challenges that we have in our research, at least in my research, that's related also to the geography and where we are. So uh, thank you for asking that. And is there something that you're finding particularly exciting as, as full of potential when you when you see about how to resolve those problems or take them up in some way? Can you give us an inside tip? Yes, I mean, um, there's projects that I'm working on using, for example, new materials uh, in uh, electrical machines. We are using new manufacturing techniques, um, some, uh, 3D printing, for example. Uh, this is a new way of uh, of uh, designing and developing machines with uh, enormous potential to overcome some of the shortcomings that we have with current machines. So um, yes, uh, these challenges then open up new avenues for research, new ideas, and and we're working on some of this, especially on the new materials, new design techniques. Uh, mach electrical machines for a long time were designed in a certain way, and now that's been released and opened up. Uh, creating three-dimensional flux paths inside the machine, uh, allowing 3D uh, printing. So yeah, there's this, there's so much of exciting work going on uh, that does not only apply to cold climates, but some of the work I'm talking about now. But uh, uh, a lot of the work initiated here, because we are located here and we have manufacturers. For example, we have Rio Tinto, which is a local manufacturer of some of these materials. We have uh, Dana TM4, which manufactures electric vehicle drives for buses and trucks for Quebec and, and, and outside. So because of uh, the uh, industry that is here and my very strong uh, desire to work with local industry to help them to build Montreal and Quebec and Canada. Um, so we're working on projects that uh, initiated in, the, in this region because of our locality, but then very often you can spread that out further. So you develop something for cold climates well, it could also work quite well in, in warm climates. So yes, uh, being here as initiated and, and developed and brainstormed new ideas, but they're also applicable to a much wider audience. Thanks, Preg. Um, uh, if you could please um, now pose your question to Zainab, that would be great. Sure. Zainab, I was very interested in, uh, <clears throat> in looking at your bio um, and you're working on very interesting work, uh, doing some very interesting research. Uh, something, of course, that's uh, challenging all of us is the pandemic and uh, the role of government. Now, I'm not going to ask you about the role of government in the pandemic, because that's maybe not your area, but in, in respect to the marketplace. Um, so you have the role of government in the marketplace, but during a pandemic, what changes, what are the challenges associated with that? Thank you, Prague. Um, yeah, this is this is a project that I sort of found myself into um, somewhat accidentally. So I'd be happy to talk about it. Um, first, yeah, as you said, I'm not a policy scholar. I'm not a political scientist, and I'm not going to talk about what the government should do, right? And then there's a lot of debates about that too. But I can talk about what government did. So we did collect data in the first wave, and it actually started with not a question related to the government. 
we were genuinely curious why Old Navy cared about our well-being. We were receiving all these emails from Old Navy uh, Canadian Tire and it's like, we're here for you. And we started to collect that. Um, and it turned out that the idea of risk management was passed from the government to the firms and organizations to then the citizens. So the process is what we call the responsabilization. It's not a new term. It's kind of how neoliberal markets work. It's how healthcare has been managed, especially in the United States, right? You're basically societal responsibility, societal processes are downloaded or outsourced to individual citizens, right? A tipping is a great for example, example of that. So you're basically supplementing someone else's wage because of, you know, salary systems are not um, sustainable in, in ways. Um, the whole, um, one of the uh, sort of findings is like World Economic Forum. They're one of the processes that they are shaping this responsible consumer subject. Um, so we saw that uh, from, from the very beginning of the pandemic to late summer 2020, we collected all policy papers, all uh, organizational communications, and we saw that the, the responsibility literally passed like a bug. So it first started with the government caring about that, but suddenly government sort of shifted the responsibility to the firms and organizations and firms and organizations became our best friend. And that really lasted three, four weeks. And then basically citizens were on their own and citizens are told to do the right thing, right? But what we know that everybody has a different interpretation of doing the right thing. So it's kind of, you know, cause a chaos. And, um, and uh, you know, we can see that for example, reinforcements of masks, when, when information is ambiguous, people do not understand and the ordinary citizens do not understand what risk is, right? I don't understand what risk is myself. Um, so when you get this sort of responsibility without the tools and resources to manage the responsibility and, and it's not even your job, right? It's not even your job to actually protect other citizens from the risk, um, but we are actually downloaded that. Um, and we see that in like green consumption, recycling. Uh, so it becomes our job to save um, Uber drivers, right? From, you know, protect Uber drivers from getting uh, infected. It becomes our job to protect cashiers at the grocery store from be becoming infected. And we see that that messaging gradually increased uh, from we're here for you, we're there for you, we will do everything to protect our citizens to protect our kinfolk, right? <laughs> to protect other people. Um, and we thought we, when we finished this project, um, I never wanted to see any newspaper article about COVID again. So we shut it down after a second wave. We thought things will change, but like my, my casual observation is it just repeats itself. It's like Groundhog Day, right? Uh, we're in like fourth wave and it's the same. So that when things get really, really risky and high and tension, you kind of get a comp like compassionate message, but then, we're on our own again. Um, so sort of that's the cycle and, and research, not my own, but other research also shows that ordinary citizens do not, do not do well. I mean, it's not again, their job to be responsible to save other people's lives, in their, their, but they also don't know how to do it anyway. Um, projects like that failed. Um, so yeah, I ended up reading everything written about COVID. Um, I do not recommend that. It was not fun. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Zainab. I, I also spent a lot of time reading far too much about COVID, but <laughs> not, not related to my research. Um, uh, would you mind now posing your question to Rafiq, please? Rafiq, um, so I know very little about nanomaterials and I was fascinated about that. And because they're nano, we don't see them in everyday lives, right? It's not like, you know, I talk about dogs or cats, they're materially very, very salient. So if you would like to like tell us about how, you know, and we do the, the outcomes or the implications of your work in our everyday lives, like if I'm walking around and I wanna look at something as like, oh, that's Rafik's work, right? It actually is rooted. Um, I'll be really grateful because I'm really curious about it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that question. Uh, that's really uh, an excellent question. Uh, and, you're, and you're right, they are nano, so we don't see them, but uh, it turns out that you know, nanomaterials have been around even for thousands of years. Just back then we didn't know, well, people didn't know that they were making nanomaterials and, and they are there, but it, it, it seems as consumers, we sometimes don't know as much about it. Like uh, you'll see that uh, 
car manufacturers are probably were among the first one to lead the charge by integrating nanomaterials in, in, in bumpers, for example, to make them scratch resistant or, uh, you know, uh, or more resistant to, uh, to, to impact, uh, uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies developing nano formulations to improve the interactions between a, a drug molecule and the body, uh, or uh, even for decontamination, right, where you have a teaspoon worth of uh, nanomaterials and have the same surface area as a couple of football fields right so uh but in what i guess relates directly to my work i i would say that the whole uh the, the one of the sort of the, the sustainable part came when we started working with uh, green energies and biofuels which we hope that that will be something we can make a mark uh on uh you know in everyday life and it starts off uh that the sort of the current way of making biofuels usually relies on refined oils which means you have to take an agricultural land grow a crop harvest a crop process the crop get the oil refine the oil make the biofuel and we thought well this seems a little bit inefficient in how we do it and uh it also sort of bothered uh, my students and I in the sense that it was sort of contributing to the food versus fuel debate. And we thought that this is not a good situation to be in. But if we can make this a lot more sustainable, one, by uh, trying to sustainably make materials that can uh, sort of speed up the uh, reaction, lower the requirements, the energetics that would require for the formation of biofuels. But instead of relying on refined crops, or anything like that. What if we were to use waste? What if we were to use waste oils or uh, maybe inedible oils, which we are blessed with in nature? I mean, uh, so definitely, uh, you know, what we're trying to do is really find a way where we can uh, do this, uh, you know, efficiently, where we can do this in a cost-effective method so that it can gain acceptability. And once we're able to make these uh, biofuels or other clean fuels, then these are something we would see that become more integrated a lot more easily uh, in cars and buses and trains and so on and so forth. And the other area that hopefully we will be able to sort of uh, forge a path in is in making cheap sensing devices. And we are blessed that we're living in a country like Canada with a very advanced healthcare system. But what we are trying to do is find a way to build a uh, sensing devices that uh, on something as simple as paper, you know, a piece of paper, which we can use as sensing devices, and we can use it to sense things like uh, glucose, uh, you know, for people who are diabetic, or uh, even building uh, environmental sensors that can be used to detect the presence of contaminants, or heavy metals in waters and soils. And I think the idea is, uh, is, is to be able to have this kind of technology available everywhere, and not just to you know, to us here in Canada or in in the developed countries, we want this to be far-reaching and to, to touch many people's lives. But thank you for your question. So I guess I can ask uh, Carly my question. Yes, right. please. Uh, so Carly, as somebody who looks at sustainability, but from a sort of a much different, much more different perspective, you look at it from a, a whole eco. Uh, system, you look at cities, you look at green spaces, and sort of the interplay between all of that. How do we go about to reconcile the fact that our populations and cities are growing, there is an increasing demand for housing for commercial spaces, and that is going to directly reduce the green space that is available to us? How do we deal with something like that? That is a great question, and I hope you ask me again in like ten years. Uh, but I can give you I can give you a start to answering that. And one interesting thing to to note is that our cities are growing in population, but they are actually growing in space more than you would expect based on the number of people moving in. So they're actually sprawling, and this is a huge challenge for, for the natural world, right? We're, we're taking up space for, for our cities that is essential to maintaining you know, a healthy environment, a good climate, biodiversity. And so there are many good reasons to densify our cities. And so living, living in denser areas has a lot of sustainability benefits um, in terms of maintaining space, natural space outside our cities, but also for the people who live there, right? Cities that are 
more walkable, maybe you need less transit, uh, more integrated communities. But as you densify your cities, and this is the part that I'm really interested in with my lab, as you densify your cities, along with all of these good things, you get some real challenges in terms of people's access to nature, which is what you bring up with the green spaces. So if we densify too much, we know that comes with increased heat, for example, we have less green space, those are hotter spaces that can be you know, deadly during heat waves. Our more dense spaces potentially could have worse air quality, they could have less access to nature for people. And so there are a few things that I really think about when I think about the way that we densify our cities. And one is, are we maintaining you know, large, high quality green spaces that can provide benefits and access to a lot of people? So when we decide where to build, are we building in that nice patch of forest that could be providing lots of benefits? Or are we building on you know, a formerly developed site or abandoned land or somewhere that is providing less of these other benefits to us? So selecting where we build carefully making sure that our green spaces are the best that they can be. So when we do have green spaces in the city, are they providing multiple benefits? How are we managing them? And you can imagine, you know, do we have just a lawn, which is maybe not providing us a very high level of benefit, or do we have trees that are reducing heat waves, native plants that are supporting bees and birds and wildlife, um, spaces that are conducive to relaxation and mental health. So really making the most of the green spaces we have and thinking creatively across disciplines about how do you green these dense spaces in maybe less conventional ways? Are we bringing in green roofs, green facades, you know, green alleyways like we see in Montreal, where we're integrating nature into the fabric of the city so that we can live densely with a smaller footprint, but still access nature. And across all of this, maybe the most important thing to think about is, are we doing this equitably? So are we greening in a, our cities in a way that we provide access to nature and the benefits that nature provides to everyone who lives there, regardless of wealth, of race, of class. Um, and currently we are, we are not in most of our cities. And so I think we really do a, a disservice when we look at things from a broad perspective of, oh, how much green space do we have in a city compared to saying, how accessible is that space to everyone who has access and who doesn't? So greening through an, an equity lens. Thanks. My turn to ask a question before I put my mic down. Sorry about that. <laughs> please, please go ahead. <laughs> so I am going to, to ask a question here to Stephanie. And so uh, I am fascinated by the work you do on digital, um, digital technologies and social media, especially. And I, I tend to think of social media as, as a space that is not always the most positive space. Uh, you know, people tell you don't read the comments on things that you, that you publish. And I'm really curious if you can, can maybe give us another perspective about how people are using digital technologies and social media to create more inclusive, more positive spaces. Absolutely, thanks Carly, it's a great question. Um, especially because I think we go back and forth in popular perception around technology. You know, I think uh, a decade ago, people viewed social media as having a lot more possibility. And now we kind of see it as doom and gloom. And there's also a lot of panic about new technology, new platforms as they come out. And so um, I think what we need to do is look at social media and apps with, um, you know, hearty empirical lens, um, avoid panic, um, but to also look at what are the what, what are the actual risks and harms that could possibly be um, uh, facilitated by these technologies as well. So there's a history, you know, of people finding other people like themselves through digital technology. So at different points in history or in different locations where it's been, um, you know, dangerous uh, to be out as LGBTQ plus, 
Uh, people have found uh, solace on, in chat rooms and online through different technologies. They've found other people like themselves and be, been able to connect and form communities. Um, and this is really important. And my research shows that that's even still happening today, right? So people are getting on apps and you might be physically located in a space where you feel like there's no one else like you, but be able to open up a dating app and see, hey, there are other people who identify the same way that I do. Um, and so that can provide a sense where you're not so alone um, and, and a sense of community. Uh, and in some of my research, I've really looked at, you know, specifically with um, queer women, you know, how are they using dating apps to form relationships? How are they using Instagram to self-brand and be part of not only a community of queer women on Instagram, but also find some element of economic success or, or like I said, self-branding so that they can build a reputation. And we know that social media reputation sometimes can transfer over to some form of profitability. And then on other apps, um, such as video sharing apps, the way that people might be able to share really important messages of solidarity around social movements. Um, and so we've seen you know, coalitions of people who are joining together in relation to, for example, sexual identity and racialized identity, joining together to say, hey, I also stand for your rights. Um, so technology can really be a catalyst for this in terms of helping people to spread their messages. On the other hand, what comes up in this research is also, you know, barriers to that. So one thing you need to do in order to find other people like you is to disclose something personal about yourself. And social media platforms are not very great at giving us the agency to decide how far that information travels and to, to you know, really adjust the amount of privacy that we have around those disclosures so that we can still connect with others, but maybe not everybody across all of our networks can see that information. So that's one barrier. Another barrier, like you said, is uh, this uh, you know, issue of don't read the comments or harassment that people are experiencing. And so there's a definite need for platforms and apps to look at how do we protect vul vulnerable populations who use our technologies? How do we provide better recourse for people? You know, is a report button enough? Is there more that we can do with all the technology that we have? Um, and then we also, you know, find that uh, some people experience greater censorship on social media than others. And so uh, queer people and women still experience a greater deal of censorship, a great, greater deal more censorship than other people on social media. And uh, it's uh, part of my research to look into, well, why is that? You know, is it a glitch in the configuration of how uh, things are served up to us on platforms or is it something um, that goes deeper, that's linked to broader biases in our society and how can we address that? So there's a lot there, but we need to look at both um, the opportunities and the risks of using social media. And so speaking of risks, my question is for Thomas. Um, Thomas, I was looking at uh, the different research that you do and I was thinking, wow, I could never be a financial investor <laughs> because I worry a lot. Um, and your research touches on all these different risks that investors have to measure up and weigh and then decide what they're going to do. And so I was wondering if you could tell us more about what impacts environmental, social, and technological trends have on financial markets, and how do investors manage these trends and these risks? Thanks a lot, Stephanie, thanks. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, let, let me start by saying that uh, the financial markets are relatively good when there's a, a, a risk that exists and uh, a lot, enough, enough parties face this risk the financial markets typically develop tools to manage the risk. So in other words, if you have an export transaction between Canada and, and uh, the Eurozone, let's say, um, the currency risk that you have, uh, you can easily manage. There's, there's all kinds of different instruments that you can purchase, that you can trade in. Um, so if the Euro, for example, depreciates in value, you can purchase an instrument that pays off. And so you make up for, for any shortfall there. Um, those things have been developed, uh, you know, uh, for, for all kinds of markets. So airlines can manage the, the price, uh, the price risk of uh, jet fuel if you want to. Um, we even have seen uh, 
I think it's already two decades ago, probably, uh, where orange plantation owners in Florida, they have uh, uh, instruments available that pay off when, the, when there is frost, essentially. So when, when, when the orange plantations uh, freeze over and they, they, they stand to lose a lot of money, then those instruments uh, pay off. So ultimately, um, one, of the, one of the goals, I suppose, of my research would be to, uh, for, for each of the risks, um, to first of all, see how we can uh, you know, model it, uh, measure it, I guess, and in the end also manage it. And for the management, you do need often those, those instruments. So can we uh, extend you know, uh, the, the, the tools available for uh, companies, for banks, insurance companies, and so on, um, you know, to, to that, that they can use essentially to protect themselves against the, the, the various risks you know, that they face right now. So you could have a pandemic bond, you know, something that pays off if, there's, if the next pandemic strikes, you know. Um, you could have a flooding bond or, or, you know, wildfire bond and so on. So, so um, that is ultimately the goal. And uh, maybe coming back to, to closing the, the, the circle, I suppose, to say that, but the, the problem is that, you know, uh, at least on the business side, the, the smaller businesses, they don't often know how to protect themselves. The larger businesses, they have well-developed risk management departments. They have some expertise, but ultimately, I think it is it is in many cases up to the government to to uh, provide proper regulations and and guidelines and so on to make sure that first of all, smaller companies they have the tools available to protect themselves, and uh, that those are properly regulated also, and uh, that there are certain guidelines to to prevent in the end that. Uh, you know, risks. Uh, you know, to go go from the corporate level to the to the to the economy level. So, in other words, uh, um, that because there's a hurt. Or say, for example, the wildfires in California. They cost uh, one of the largest utility companies in California to go bankrupt uh, because their their power lines in the end actually they sparked. Uh, they had sparks and they caused a wildfire, so they were sued uh, for billions of dollars. Um, you know. Um, and that created even there, you know, some some uh, some systemic risk because uh, it was a large company and many companies depended on that. So, you know, how can we protect the smaller players that that uh, don't have the expertise to to do it themselves, um, to the large or and support also the larger players uh, uh, with the, with the know how I suppose to uh, yeah use the proper tools and to make them available and to regulate them and so on. So, yeah, a lot of work to be done there. <laughs> Anyway, thanks so Thank much. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> thanks so much, everybody, for these questions. It's been uh, super interesting. We have just uh, about nine minutes left. Um, and so we can take questions from the audience if you would like to post them in the Q&A or just raise your electric hand. Um, the other thing we can do is our panelists can continue asking each other questions. And I know that um, that Thomas, I think you have a question for Pratt. Um, would you like to uh, pose that? Uh, yeah, if, if you don't mind, uh, and I hope Pratt that doesn't catch you by surprise, uh, but uh, I, you know, I, I, I always wonder, you know, when it's, uh, you know, I mean, we, we are moving probably to an all electric vehicle future, is, I suppose, you know, we don't know how quickly, but uh, uh, I guess that's how the future will look. I always personally wonder, you know, uh, if you travel and you need to go well, to the equivalent of what we have nowadays, what a gas station would be, you know, um, and it's going to take you half an hour to, to reach out to your car so you can continue going if you travel long distance. Uh, you know, is the infrastructure, you know, in terms of, I mean, in that case, the, the, the available parking lots or the, the demand on the power grid, you know, uh, if there's hundreds or thousands of cars that stand here, they recharge their batteries. Uh, are we ready for, for this? Uh, I know it's a tough question, but <laughs> sorry. Well, we, we're not yet ready for that. And there's an enormous amount of research going on on, on the electrical grid, the impact of electric vehicles. Fortunately, in a way, it's uh, ramping up fairly slowly so they can absorb what we have at the moment. But uh, as you talked about, uh, as we uh, deepen the penetration of electric vehicles into the uh, electrical grid, um, the impacts will be larger. And we, uh, there are several different uh, problems associated with, with that one regarding uh, what is called maximum demand or the demand, the, how much of power you can send through a line or a distribution system or a charging port uh, uh, instantaneously. So um, 
the power as we know it now, it's coming from Basin James. So uh, the power has to be generated there and, it's, and it has to flow all the way to the charging station in Montreal. Um, so how we manage the power flow, uh, there's a lot of work to be done in that. But uh, even more importantly, the new area that we're talking about <clears throat> is the possibility of using the vehicles to generate power in emergencies. Now you have back power flow from the load, essentially from the vehicle, back into the system. This changes the whole dynamics. It, there are protection issues, there are safety issues that arise from that, uh, that still need to be addressed. We are not set up for that. Um, so no, the grid is not yet ready, but uh, what is called a smart grid is being developed. And um, we, we can do certain amount at the moment. And there's a lot of exciting work to be done just on the grid side. So let alone the electric vehicle design side, but being able to support that uh, there's opportunities also because the, the power consumption from the grid is very cyclic. We have a peak in Montreal, we have a peak in the early morning, uh, electrical consumption and a, another peak in the early evening. Uh, at around two o'clock in, in the morning, it's a valley. So there's a lot of opportunities for charging vehicles at that time. And then even you can supply the peak. Now the, to supply that peak, it's very expensive. So uh, you can actually use the vehicles to supply power during the peak. If it's not being used, if they if they've already if they're still in the garage, haven't left for for work, already at work, so there's so many new opportunities that, are, that arise as a result of electric vehicles. Uh, the challenges are not only in one direction; they're actually opportunities as well. Thank you. That's that's interesting. Thank you, <laughs> Craig. I believe you had a question for Carly. Would you like to pose it to her? Excuse me. Oh, you're, you're muted now, Craig. Sorry, Carly. Um, in the recent article in, uh, in uh, CBC News, I think it was, uh, on Montreal, uh, the local section, they talked about the correlation between green spaces and uh, socioeconomic um, uh, ability. So lower income households or neighborhoods tend to have less green spaces. Uh, we have an example, Mont town of Mont-Royal is very green, high income. Right next door is uh, Park X. Low income, you don't see much green space. Well, there are a few parks, but nothing like Mont uh, Montreal. So there's a direct correlation, it appears, uh, except that sometimes there are some aberrations, like in old Montreal, you have high income, but uh, less green space. Um, so is that a way to, can you use green space to change the economic, socioeconomic status, or can you comment on that whole correlation? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I can comment on that. Um, and that's a, you know, a well known pattern that we see across many, many cities, especially with with trees and canopy in particular. And so, you know, think about Montreal, where do we see nice, big, old, diverse trees? We see them in Westmount, we see them in town of Mount Royal. Uh, and that's I use that example in my class all the time. Look at a satellite image of Montreal, you see this nice green square around town of Mount Royal. And there's a line where you switch to park extension and it drops off. And that's, you know, in some ways, it's, it's hard to tease out cause and effect. You know, is it that people with more wealth, with, with more money, choose to live in greener neighborhoods? Or is it that when you have you know, wealth and social capital, also you can advocate for greener neighborhoods and it goes the other way? It's probably a feedback between the two. And it also comes down to the way we build our cities. Are there, is there space to plant those trees? Areas with more single family homes, with yards, with wider streets, have more space for planting. And so it is a, it's a persistent pattern. It's a pattern that many cities are now trying to break. Uh, and we sometimes call that, you know, tree equity. How do we ensure that everybody, regardless of, of wealth, regardless of race has access to to nature, to trees and the benefits they provide. Um, but of course that takes a very long time because trees grow slowly. It's not something where we can snap our fingers and have a mature tree canopy you know, overnight. It's going to take, to take decades. And so there are, there are programs certainly, uh, the, the organization So Verdi in Montreal does wonderful work working with uh, private, private landowners, also, also businesses and schools to go in and they subsidize tree planting and, and green those spaces. Uh, but it is something that we don't necessarily think about, but is, is baked into the design of our cities that we have less access. 
Another thing we need to think about is quality. So Montreal, our, our parks are actually fairly well distributed in Montreal across the city, fairly equitably distributed. But is the quality of those parks you know, equal across different boroughs in different neighborhoods? And do people feel welcome and safe and like those parks are for them and they can use them? And so there are multiple different axes to, to access that we can think of. It's not just can you physically get somewhere, but do you feel that this is a space for you to use? Thanks, uh, Carly, and thank you to all of the panelists. This has been um, such an interesting event. We've covered topics from materials, um, nanomaterials, and wool, and art, and social responsibility, and sustainability, um, social media, electric vehicles. Uh, I just can't believe how uh, how uh, broad, but actually how linked uh, these topics are. So thank you so much for taking the time and, and sharing with us your ideas and your research. Um, and at this point, I'll just pass it over to Anna to close the session. Thank you. Thanks. And thank you, Paula, for being here and moderating. Uh, as always, it's a pleasure to work with you. And all of you, just to continue Paula's point, this is the idea here is for us to uh, shine the light on the new Concordia University research chairs on the programs that you're developing with your in your labs in your studios with your students etc and to give you an opportunity to connect with one another we gave you a little bit of homework this time around and you met the challenge so thank you very much for engaging with one another in this way. It's been very fun for us to listen to this conversation and uh, hopefully you, this is a start of some relationships uh, in development in terms of your research programs. And I guess I'll just note that for us at Force Space, where we are interested in connecting with the research various initiatives and what's happening across the university in a, and connecting this to what's happening in the city and um, you know outside of our kind of internal community, will definitely be knocking on your door to continue working with you um, in this way so that we can uh, engage in further deep dives into your research. I'd like to give a special thanks to our in-house guests here today, Carly, Stephanie, and Rafiq. Thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you here with us and all thank the you. rest of you. Thank you for joining us on Zoom as well. We appreciate your time. On that note, we're going to close the webinar and bid you farewell. See you next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.